Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. And you're listening to Eyes on Saudi, our special series this week as part of our regular Dissidents and Dictators podcast to highlight important human rights issues in Saudi Arabia, particularly as world leaders gather for the G20 summit this weekend, which is coincidentally being hosted by Saudi Arabia. Our aim is to spotlight the great lengths that the Saudi regime goes to in order to improve its image globally and whitewash its grave human rights record. All right. Um, so my name is John Scott Rilton. I'm a senior researcher at the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School. And the Citizen Lab has been around for almost two decades, and our work focuses on trying to understand digital threats to civil society organizations around the globe, whether that is hacking or disinformation, defacement or censorship. And for years at the lab, we have tracked a global market that sells surveillance tools to dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. And year after year, what we have found is that there's a new normal in the world of surveillance. Once upon a time, if you wanted to conduct sophisticated hacking, you needed to have a well-developed STEM sector in your country. You needed to have people who could do math, computer science, and engineering. The world has changed though, and today all you need is a checkbook. And for years, my colleagues, especially Bill Marzak, who's on this conversation with me, have worked to track the global impact of that industry to identify people who've been hacked with the technology and to try to shine light on the perpetrators. One player that has really come into its own as a consumer of these technologies has been Saudi Arabia. So uh, I'd like to welcome my colleague, uh, Bill Marzak to our conversation now. Bill, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. And what I want you to do, Bill, um, for those who are listening, is to take us back to the period where we began to really track the Saudi use of Pegasus spyware. And perhaps you can begin by telling us just a little bit about what Pegasus spyware is and who makes it. Yeah, so NSO Group's Pegasus spyware is a solution that is sold to governments and allows governments who purchase it to remotely hack into targets phones and pretty much access anything on the phone, uh, whether it's uh, stored messages, uh, intercepting uh, calls on WhatsApp or Signal, uh, accessing location data, passwords, uh, photos, contacts, calendars, pretty much mm -hmm. everything on the device. Um, and mm -hmm. so we've been investigating this for a, a number of years. We actually obtained and analyzed uh, a sample of the spyware in 2016, which informs mm -hmm. a lot of our understanding of it. Um, but around uh, 2018, around the summer, uh, was when we first started really digging into um, looking at Saudi Arabia's use of, of NSO Group spyware. Um, and one of the uh, first targets that we were able to identify was uh, an individual by the name of Omar Abdulaziz uh, in Montreal, uh, who has uh, several very funny uh, YouTube shows where he uh, pokes, pokes fun at the uh, Saudi royal family and uh, Mohammed bin Salman, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, as you might expect, puts him uh, pretty squarely in the, in the radar of the, uh, the Saudi exactly. government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we found Omar? Yeah, so one of the techniques we were doing um, back in the summer of 2018, uh, we were doing some internet scanning, which allowed us to I basically identify where users were who were infected with the spyware. Um, mm -hmm. And the sort of level at which we could see this was, you know, oh, well, there's someone on this ISP. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, you know, we were able to see, you know, if, you know, which province or maybe even which which metro area they might be located in mm -hmm. um, through this through this technique. Um, so one of the interesting things that we observed was that um, some of the uh, spyware servers we had linked to Saudi Arabia, we saw some uh, devices 
uh, or look like maybe one or, or a small number of devices uh, communicating uh, with these servers from the Montreal area in Canada. Um, so these are and, these are phones yeah. that are infected with Pegasus, right? Yeah, these are phones uh, that are infected mm-hmm. with Pegasus, and we're we're trying to basically track down uh, where they're located, um, potentially in in some cases to identify, uh, maybe even identify who the targets are, as we were able to in this case. Um, because mm-hmm. one of the interesting things we found is that uh, we saw um, indications that this this device in Montreal was was uh, connecting from two different ISPs at, at different times. Uh, so we saw connections from Videotron, a home ISP, as well as Risk, uh, an academic ISP uh, in mm-hmm. the Montreal area, um, and uh, it sort of sort of looked like there was someone perhaps associated with the, with a university or educational institution who was the target uh, in this case. Um, mm-hmm. So you knew, just to reconstruct this, um, you knew we knew that there was an infection in Canada, and that the infected device seemed to be moving back and forth between these two networks. That could still describe a lot of people and a lot of phones. How did you find him? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, So the first thing that we did is we sort of, you know, uh, examined our mental model and we thought, well, um, if you know, Saudi Arabia is is spying on someone in the Montreal area. You know, what sort mm. of target is that likely to be? You know, who who should we get in touch with? Who should we try and uh, you know mm. uh, check their phones to see if they're they're infected? Um, so one of the things that we you know assumed was okay. Well, you know, if if uh, Saudi Arabia is spying on someone in Canada, uh, probably that person is going to be a, a dissident or an activist. So let's sort of uh, I don't know pick like the top. 10 uh, dissidents, activists, uh, journalists, lawyers uh, in the Montreal area that, you know, work on issues related to Saudi Arabia and uh, get in touch with them, uh, check their phones to see if they've got the uh, telltale Pegasus SMS, uh, which might have caused the infection of their phone, or, you know, uh, examine their internet traffic, see if there's active communication with, uh, with the Pegasus spyware servers. Um, so that's basically what we did. We, we uh, drew up a list and uh, just started... Uh, started contacting these people, started meeting with them in person. Uh, and uh, eventually we got to, uh, to Omar and we found the telltale uh, Pegasus SMS on his phone indicating that he was in fact targeted. Um, and uh, that's, okay. uh, that's how we got to him. Okay, so when you say found the Pegasus SMS on his phone, um, let's, let's break that down. So we've got a Saudi guy who is in Canada, highly critical mm-hmm. of the government. You get in touch with him. Uh, what's his response when you first contact him? <laughs> it's funny. Um, so the first call that I had with him, he said, you know, I, I sort of, um, you know, broached the subject. Hey, well, maybe, maybe you're uh, being spied on. Maybe the target is you. Um, and he mm-hmm. said, Oh, I'm sure it's me. It's it's got to be me. <laughs> so he uh, he was sort of almost expecting. Uh, that uh, that he was under surveillance. You're and waiting I for said, your why? call, yeah. Yeah, and so I asked him why. Uh, why do you think this? And he sort of mentioned how in the past uh, few weeks um, there were a bunch of interesting things or suspicious things happening. Uh, some of his friends and family members back in Saudi Arabia were being sort of inexplicably rounded up and arrested. Mm. Hmm. And that led him to believe that maybe his communications were being monitored, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so it was sort of, you know, a a suspicion. He didn't really have, um, you know, hard evidence or or proof at that point. Um, But, you know, uh, the uh, the revelation that, in fact, his phone was being was being monitored, I think, uh, connected a lot of dots in his head. Yeah. And, you know, as someone who's also had a lot of contact with with people and, you know, had to make that call and tell people. Um, that they're targeted. It's 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 quite an interesting moment because it it often is like you're talking to somebody who's been gaslit in an abusive relationship, and they're like, "Oh my mm. God, this the pieces fall together now." So yeah. let's let's talk about finding that that evidence. You mentioned that you found a, a message on his phone. So how had he been infected? Right. Um, yeah. So when I examined Omar's phone, I found a message. Um, it was a. Uh, an SMS that said, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a shipment from DHL. Um, you know, here's the, the tracking number. Click on the link to, uh, to, to track the shipment. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so he recalls that around the time that he received this message, he had uh, just placed an order on Amazon uh, for a, 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 a big case of protein powder. Uh, so he thought, <laughs> oh, well, this is, the, uh, this is the tracking notification for that. So he clicked. Um, and that... I think was most likely the uh, the click that that caused his phone to be uh, become infected um, and then to be monitored for the next uh, next couple months. Gotcha. So um, you know, there's this like needle in a haystack of needles. We find this guy, confirm that he gets targeted, and ultimately, not too long after, we publish a report. But right after that report published, um, there was some really big news about. Uh, Saudi Arabia that it turned out we later learned was connected to Omar. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah. So uh, I think it was actually the day after we published the report. I believe we published it uh, October 1st, uh, 2018. And then the next day uh, there was news about uh, an individual by the name of uh, Jamal Khashoggi who uh, walked into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and never left. Um, and, uh, you know, as we found out in the, the days and weeks after that, um, he was, uh, murdered in the Saudi consulate, um, mm-hmm. likely at the direction of, uh, uh, Saudi's powerful crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, mm-hmm. and at first, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't really see a, a, a deep connection, but, uh, as we started talking more to, to Omar, uh, it emerged that he was actually one of Jamal's uh, close collaborators um, Mm -hmm. on a number of initiatives, uh, including a uh, uh, NGO based in Washington, D.C. called Dawn, uh, Democracy for the Arab World Now, um, as well as some efforts to try and counter Saudi propaganda on Twitter. Um, So that sort of put a lot more pieces in our heads together. We thought, oh, Mm -hmm. wow, like this... There's this really close nexus here between this uh, government surveillance of of uh, Omar's phone and a targeted killing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it really, I think, you know, if you talk to Omar, he'll tell you that he believes that there's this connection as well, and that mm-hmm. the monitoring of his device was used, perhaps partly to justify um, the dossier that was was compiled against Jamal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Omar was a target. But he wasn't the only person targeted with uh, Pegasus spyware by the, the Saudi operator during that period. Do you want to tell That's us about right. some of the other cases? Yeah. Uh, so there were actually a bunch of other uh, cases of people who were targeted uh, by the Saudi Pegasus operator. Um, among these cases, uh, so our uh, close collaborators at Amnesty International uncovered um, an individual in London by the name of Yahya Asiri, um, who works at... Al-Qust, which is a London-based uh, organization that does uh, advocacy and activism around Saudi Arabia. Uh, mm-hmm. And in fact, it also emerged that uh, one of Amnesty's own employees was targeted, um, their phone was targeted in the same operation. Um, you know, as, as uh, you know, we kept getting in touch with, with more targets and kept trying to check for these uh, telltale SMSs, uh, we also found that uh, uh, Ben Hubbard, the Beirut bureau chief of the New York Times uh, was was targeted uh, by the same Saudi operator, and uh, another individual in London, uh, Ranem Al uh who's another satirist uh, with a popular online show like Omar, uh, was was also targeted. So there are these interesting cases, um, and there there were there were others beyond that, if I remember correctly, as well, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we get a lot of. Uh, you know, cases where we get in touch with people and, you know, we have to be very careful to make sure we get the consent of the target before, you know, we can name them publicly. But yes, there are there are definitely other cases uh, linked to this, uh, the Saudi spying operation. So, you know, when I look at this case, um, it really, in the, you know, the context of the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, it really highlights to me um, this observation. So, I remember back in the sort of 70s, and 80s, and 90s, there was this perception that if you were like a critic of a repressive government, you could go to a democracy and put some physical distance between yourself and that government and remain a critic. 
and have some degree of protection. It feels to me like part of what the goal is of this technology is to try to erode that protection. Because what you just described is dissidents and government critics and satirists and reporters physically distant, but yet targeted. Um, Do you think I'm right? Yes, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Physical distance is no longer uh, really a protection, Um, of course, because, you know, we're all connected these days through the internet uh, and we're all using these devices, our cell phones, where basically our whole uh, lives are, are on these devices. Um, and, you know, it's uh, a lot easier to reach across the internet than it is to, you know, get, uh, get people on a plane and, and uh, you know, uh, try and intimidate someone on the ground. So it's um, definitely a new world uh, in terms of this stuff. Um, but I think that, you know, there's still probably uh, some role that uh, the governments can play. You know, we see a little bit of, of evidence here with things like, you know, NSO groups saying, well, you know, we don't allow our customers to spy in some some of these countries, um, whereas, you know, other countries are fair game. So there is still some role that, um, you know, geopolitics plays in this. But I think that the mm-hmm. Internet makes it a lot easier to to do this, uh, you know, spying and projection of, of power outside your borders. So, you know, having talked to Omar and others, um, they often situate their discussion of being targeted in the context of other more physical things um, mm-hmm. that are associated with the Saudi government. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so there, you know, with with Omar in particular, there were several cases where, um, you know, people, uh, representatives from the Saudi government did try mm-hmm. and, you know, convince him uh, to try and you know go to the the, uh, the Saudi embassy, or they came and they met with him in person, and uh, you know basically tried to to get him to come back to Saudi Arabia, sort of like a mm-hmm. uh, you know come on home. There'll be a great deal waiting for you. We can make you a rich man if you take this deal. The only thing you have to do is uh, stop criticizing the the Saudi government. Um, so it's this you know sort of a dual. Uh, dual threat that that people are facing. It's sort of the the carrot and the stick. Um, You know, hey, if you come back, there's this nice offer waiting for you. But if you don't play ball, you know, we've got this whole arsenal of powerful tools that we can deploy against you. I've got to say, it reminds me of the uh, saying often ascribed to Mexican cartels, which was plata o plomo, (laughs) right? Silver or lead. So Let's talk about this in the broader context of Saudi Arabia's responses to this. So Citizen Lab published a report. Mm -hmm. Others have come forward. What has Saudi said in response to these uh, claims and reports and investigations linking it to hacking? Mm. Well, that's a great question. I think that in terms of our reports looking at uh, Saudi Arabia's use of Pegasus, um, I'm not aware that they've issued any sort of, you know, strong denial of that. Um, of course, there have been other um, other hacking allegations, like there was the, you know, the widely reported uh, Bezos story, which uh, Saudi Arabia strenuously uh, denied. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't really believe that there's been any substantial denial from Saudi Arabia. You know, we've seen, of course, NSO Group responding to, to some of the findings uh, right. with, you know, like throwing, trying to throw a little bit of shade without, you know, uh, pointing to exactly uh, where they think our, you know, stuff is wrong. They just kind of, you know, like um, uh, try to say that, that uh, our research is not good without, uh, you know, calling any, any uh, claims or facts in, into issue. Um, so mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's been an interesting response. I, I'd say that, you know, um, the, uh, the kind of like, you know, uh, very meek, uh, denials or sort of not non-denial denials, um, I think should give people confidence that our, that our work is actually, um, very mm-hmm. good, uh, in terms of its methodology and, uh, you know, the conclusions are right. Yeah. So this brings you to another question, which is in, I'm no lawyer, but in the cases that we've just talked about here, Saudis, not in Saudi Arabia, being targeted with hacking tools and being hacked. Mm-hmm. that usually violates the local laws of whatever country they happen to be in, whether it's the UK or, or Canada. Mm-hmm. Have we really seen any governments pushing back, governments, host governments for these people pushing back and um, calling out Saudi Arabia or otherwise um, challenging them for doing this? 
Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, I don't think we've seen the same sort of responses that, that, you know, we'd see, for instance, like, you know, the United States indicting like Iranian or Chinese hackers, a uh, very clear mm-hmm. signal there. Um, but I don't think we've really seen, you know, we, of course, there's been reports dribbling out about, uh, oh, you know, the, the uh, FBI or whoever is investigating, you know, Group X, um, you know, that, that's doing hacking. Um, you know, I think there was an investigation of NSO group that, that's, uh, that's going on by the FBI. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's been some, uh, you know, mm-hmm. little response like that, but there hasn't really been a strong, uh, you know, calling out of, of these mm-hmm. sorts of groups uh, mm-hmm. for, for this sort of spying. Um, you know, what we've seen on the other hand, though, is targets themselves trying to take you know, the process of, of getting, you know, accountability and justice into their own hands by filing mm-hmm. uh, civil cases against some of these mm-hmm. governments uh, and uh, uh, hacking companies. Yeah, so the civil cases are a really interesting angle. And I think, you know, we will have to see where some of those uh, end up. But um, there's an interesting coda to this, uh, which is some of the folks who have uh, represented Pegasus victims um, mm-hmm. have been themselves the targets of Pegasus spyware. Uh, do you want to talk mm. about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um, you know, as, as of course, you know, you're well aware of the uh, the ongoing legal action um, in Israel and Cyprus against uh, NSO Group. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, one of the things that came to light was uh, back in uh, 2019, there was this really uh, scary zero-click flaw in WhatsApp uh, where targets mm-hmm. could get these uh, WhatsApp missed calls uh, that were, you know, maliciously crafted. Uh, their phone would perhaps uh, ring, but the call would never be recorded in the logs. Um, mm-hmm. And this, uh, you know, this this sort of uh, zero click exploit is is very uh, insidious and challenges our usual methodology of of you know searching targets' phones or asking them to go back and look for SMSs. You know, you can't really look for mm-hmm. something that's not there. But uh, yeah. fortunately. Uh, Gone this, dark. this this lawyer who was who was targeted uh, did uh, recall this this weird behavior you know these these uh, WhatsApp missed calls that that didn't show up in the logs um, and uh, you know uh, of course WhatsApp uh, investigated this found the the vulnerability and and uh, alerted the targets and he was uh, he was one of those targets he was one of them yeah um, and uh, that's not the only targeting that lawyers representing um, some of these. Uh, Pegasus victims have, have experienced. Do we want to talk uh, briefly about uh, Black Cube? Yeah, well, I, th- I think you're probably the better uh, better position to talk about that than I. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, this uh, private intelligence company, Black Cube, um, started approaching, of course, you and, and uh, one of our other colleagues at Citizen Lab, uh, as well as uh, some of the lawyers working on these cases. And overall, I think, you know, based on my understanding, the goal was to try and um, undermine uh, both the the lawsuits as well as Citizen Lab's research by getting people to say kind of like embarrassing things or like admitting, mm-hmm. you know, that, uh, you know, the, uh, certain courses of action were futile or, you know, f- you know trying to uh, uncover, I guess, Black Cube was trying to purport to uncover like hidden motives or, or conspiracies maybe behind some of these actions like, oh, well, Citizen Lab, you know, must hate Israelis, which is why they, you know, uh, focus so much on NSO group, things like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was uh, actually quite, uh, quite surprising, I think. I think it's the, uh, the first time that, uh, you know, we've, we've worked on an issue where we've been sort of targeted by, by uh, you know, spooks for hire uh, as a result of, of, of our work. Yeah, and one of the things that it, it did, um, and as you, as you mentioned, um, I was one of, the, one of the targets and we managed to make the case very public um, so if you're listening to this and you Google uh, bumbling spy in New York Times, you're <laughs> going to find the story of it, um, which uh, should tell you a lot about how, how well it went for them. But mm-hmm. one of the things that it really highlighted for us is how if you have resources, and we should say we don't know who hired um, these these spies to do this. And of course, you know, Black Cube has sometimes denied that they've, they've been involved in it. Um, but uh, if you have resources... There's a lot that you can do to try to go after your critics, whether it's uh, in the physical world um, or in the digital world. I think this this takes us to this broader question about Saudi Arabia. A lot of people have said that for a period of time, the country was perhaps chastened 
by some of the response to the Hashoji affair. They weren't expecting it. Mm-hmm. Have they been chastened in their use of spyware? Are they continuing to do this kind of thing? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the evidence points to, yes, they are continuing to to do the same sort of stuff. Um, you know, the companies like NSO Group like to say, you know, oh, well, we have all of this, you know, uh, you know, menu of options which we can take in cases of abuse. But uh, we've seen comparatively little evidence that any of those remedies, uh, you know, against customers abusing their spyware have, have actually been, you know, employed to restrain that abuse. So I think that, you know, mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia continues to, to do this kind of stuff and other governments that, that we have exposed, you know, are, are still continuing to do this as well. I mean, there's, there's just, uh, you know, uh, no real consequences at the end of the day. Um, and I think that's, you know, kind of uh, uh, a, f- a function of the fact that it's hard to determine, like this, this industry, whether it's NSO Group or Black Cube, operates, you know, uh, very strongly in, in the realm of, of secrecy. And, mm-hmm. you, know, we, you know, there's very little transparency. So they, you know, they can, companies can kind of casually make allusions, you know, oh, that wasn't us, or oh, you know, we take action when we find out about abuse. But, mm-hmm. you know, without the sort of transparency, uh, they can do nothing and get away with it. And, uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, you know, say with 100% certainty they've done absolutely nothing, but uh, I don't think they've done anything that, uh, you know, uh, will restrain or have an effect uh, against the sort of abusive use of the spyware. Yeah, so people are going to be listening to this, and anytime there's a conversation about this kind of sophisticated spyware or hacking through WhatsApp, it's going to be scary. Um, mm. And people are going to wonder, how do I know if I've been targeted? What do I do if I think I'm targeted? So if I'm somebody who works in the human rights space, mm. um, and I'm listening to this, and I'm wondering if I may have been targeted, what do I do? Well, that is a great question. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, as we were talking about with these zero click exploits, it's, you know, there's not really um, anything that uh, I can tell you or that we can tell you, oh, well, just look at your phone for, you know, uh, artifact X. And if you find X, then you're targeted. If you don't find X, you're fine. Um, of course, it's in general good policy to look out for suspicious texts, WhatsApp messages, anything with a link or attachment that looks suspicious. Um, but um, of course, with these zero-click exploits, I think you know if you're if you are really a top target of one of these governments that's using the sophisticated spyware, the only thing I can really advise is you know get into contact with with uh, Citizen Lab uh, or some of our colleagues at uh, Amnesty or other organizations. Get into contact with a tech expert and have them take a look at your phone. Um, but again, I, I do want to emphasize this is really only for the the top of the top targets. The spyware is expensive. The governments don't use it against everyone. They use it against their top targets. Mm-hmm. Got it. And if I'm, uh, if I don't think that I'm part of that that category of, of top targets, um, what should I be doing uh, to be to be safer? Citizen Lab has been working on an online project uh, for a number of years, which we just handed over to Consumer Reports called Security Planner. Um, mm-hmm. You can find it by googling Security Planner. Um, which will give you some personalized uh, digital security advice to stay safer. But Bill, do you have any other thoughts um, for listeners about uh, what they should be doing? Yes, yeah, security planner is a great starting point. Um, and of course, you know the the uh, uh, the one thing if if you don't have time to to go through all this stuff, the one thing two factor authentication I think prevents a lot of uh, badness. Um, you know because most of the stuff is not this you know million dollar multi million dollar spyware. It's sort of uh, tricking people into typing in their passwords onto dodgy websites. Um, and two-factor can can really uh, uh, prevent that, especially if you use a security key. Mm-hmm. Great. And there's one more thing just to flag for those um, who think they may be targeted because of who they are or what they do. Um, the NGO Access Now runs a helpline, which you can find on their website at accessnow.org, um, which can help you with issues like if you think um, someone has taken over your account um, or is harassing you online or... Uh, you suspect that uh, your device or accounts may have been hacked. Bill, it's about time for us to wrap it up. Um, I'm wondering if you have any closing thoughts. Uh, closing thoughts. Well, um, you know, one of the things that um, people uh, respond, you know, one of the responses when they hear this sort of stuff about scary spyware is, uh-oh, you know, privacy is lost. Uh, the, you know, this is helpless, uh, a lost cause. Uh, I'll just assume that I'm being monitored all the time. And I think that, you know, that sort of defeatist approach is is not necessarily, I understand it, but I don't think it's the right response to have here. I think the takeaway 
from this sort of conversation should be, uh, yes, there's lots of scary threats out there, but mm -hmm. uh, the people like Citizen Lab, like Amnesty, who are doing counter surveillance, who are investigating this stuff, Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of smart people working on this. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're in civil society, we have your back. Um, so, uh, yes, this stuff is scary, but uh, with, um, you know, good research, with good practices, we can fight against it and, uh, you know, uh, reclaim the Internet as a safe space for civil society. A note of help. Uh, Bill Marzak, thank you so much uh, for uh, doing this conversation. Thank you, John.